Tonight, picking his partner, former President Trump may be close to announcing his running mate with just two days until the high stakes presidential debate. NBC News reporting on when we could find out who is joining Trump on the ticket. That key decision as President Biden and former President Trump prepare to face off in Atlanta. The primetime matchup could be the most watched moment of the presidential campaign. The new insight into the campaign's tactics for what could be a make or break moment. Also tonight, state of emergency. New video of catastrophic flooding wiping out roads and washing away homes in the Midwest. Residents on edge as a dam is on the verge of complete collapse. The onslaught of severe weather putting the nation's aging infrastructure to the test. The storm's targeting 29 million Americans as much of the country continues to bake in relentless heat. Mass power outage, Puerto Rico suffering as blackouts leave hundreds of thousands without electricity. Residents outraged as the island's main power company says it's suspending millions in maintenance projects. The new lawsuit as people continue to pay high rates for an unreliable grid. Deadly tax protests, violent demonstrations escalating in Kenya. Disturbing scenes as police shoot at protesters storming parliament. The government building set on fire. The president addressing the nation, urging peace amid mounting unrest. Forced to fight, Israel's Supreme Court ruling Ultra-Orthodox men must serve in the military. The decision, the latest blow to Prime Minister Netanyahu, whose coalition party could unravel without their support. Robo-Taxi City, a look inside Phoenix, where autonomous vehicles service is booming. We test out what it's like to hail a car without a driver. Our Valerie Castro joins us live to explain how it all works and if she'd do it again. Plus the new announcement on how the service is expanding. Is it coming to your city? Plus an officer putting his life on the line to save an elderly couple trapped in a fire. We'll show you how the officer burst into that house, pulling the two to safety before collapsing. How he's doing tonight. And the urgent search to find those involved in an ISIS-backed smuggling network. How they were able to enter the U.S. in the first place. Top story starts right now. And good evening. Great to be back with you with just about 48 hours to go until the first presidential debate. We're getting closer to knowing who will be running by former President Trump's side. NBC News learning Trump could make that announcement as early as this week. It could be just moments before the face off with President Biden on that debate stage. The pivotal match expected to draw millions of Americans and it could be the most watched moment of this campaign. Looking back at viewership numbers from several previous first debates, the 2016 debate between Hillary Clinton and Trump holds the record for largest debate audience with a record 84 million viewers. In 2020, more than 73 million people watched at least some of the first Trump-Biden matchup. Americans are eager to watch the Biden-Trump rematch with the economy, abortion and border crisis all top of mind. Topics the two battled over time and time again on that stage. We handed him a booming economy. He blew it. It wasn't he booming. Blew it. He blew it. Blew it wasn't. It. Joe, I, I ran because of you. The president also is opposed to Roe v. Wade. That's there are still a number of unknowns with how this could all play out. What version of Trump will we get at that podium? Will there be knocks at his criminal record? And will he take jabs at Biden's son, Hunter? Another campaign mystery close to being solved. Which of these three men, you see them right here, will be on that ticket with former President Trump. NBC's Dasha Burns in West Palm Beach, Florida tonight, the latest on a possible announcement and how both candidates are preparing for this historic rematch. Thank you very much, everybody. Tonight, a major development in former President Trump's search for a running mate. Four sources confirming to NBC News Trump is considering announcing his vice presidential pick as early as this week and possibly before Thursday's debate. The former president saying his running mate will likely be in attendance in Atlanta on Thursday. Yeah, yeah, I think we have a lot of people coming. As the final preparations are underway for the debate rematch of the century, Joe Biden versus Donald Trump. This could be the most boring, or it could be quite exciting. Who knows? Trump holding informal policy sessions with advisors as the political world waits to see if he'll bring the restraint he showed at the second debate in 2020 Never or the, the steamrolling bombast of the first. Like Hunter, Hunter, are you talking about I'm Hunter? talking about my son, Bo Biden. You're talking I don't know, about I don't know, Bo. I know Hunter. Yeah, Hunter, you know got thrown, Hunter got thrown out of the military. He graduated 
either the lowest or almost the lowest in your class. Don't ever use the word smart with me. Why would you answer that because question? Because the you question is, lot of the question Supreme is, justice, the radical question, left. Will you shut your, up, man? Listen. The Trump campaign's national press secretary, Caroline Levitt, giving us insight into the former president's preparations. Which version of Trump is going to show up on Thursday? President Trump is going to be President Trump. He will be tough. He will be focused. He will be disciplined. And he is very well prepared. Levitt also addressing this viral moment on CNN, kicked off the air by host Casey Hunt after repeatedly criticizing Jake Tapper and Dana Bash, who will serve as CNN's moderators for the debate. It would take someone five minutes to Google Jake Tapper, Donald Trump, to see that Jake Tapper has ma'am, consistently we're stop frequently this interview if you're keep President attacking Trump my colleagues. to Adolf Hilter. I, ma'am, I, I, I'm going to stop no, this interview I'm, if you I'm continue stating... to attack my colleagues. Oh, I'm sorry, guys. Debate. We're going to come back out to the panel. For, Caroline, thank the you very much for your time. For... Caroline, is attacking the moderators kind of the easy cop out for if the debate doesn't go your way? I was not attacking the moderators. What I was doing was pointing out their very long history of anti-Trump statements. Jake Tapper said that President Trump's presidency was a long American nightmare. The president agreed to a debate with with Tapper and, and Bash as the moderators. Because he's willing to go anywhere to bring his message to all voters across this great country. The Trump campaign also slamming Biden for his days of preparation without public events while Trump hits the campaign trail. Our president has been holed up at Camp David for a week without one publicly scheduled event. I think that's concerning to a lot of Americans that our current leader of the free world cannot debate prep and, and run the country at the same time. The White House says President Biden is receiving daily briefings at Camp David on national security and other issues like extreme weather. But three sources familiar with the preparations tell NBC News he's also getting ready to goad Trump into an outburst and reveal what they say is the, quote, true Trump. Biden's advice Advisors have been looking for ways to inflame the former president on the debate stage. Donald Trump lost two debates to me in 2020. And since then, he hadn't shown up for debate. Now he's acting like he wants to debate me again. Well, make my day, pal. People are going to know that he's a twice impeached, convicted felon who's been found to have defamed somebody, sexually abused somebody, and gone bankrupt six times. Now, Tom, when it comes to this highly anticipated VP announcement, the Trump campaign has consistently tried to tamp down any speculation about when he might announce or who that running mate might be, telling us in a statement that anyone telling you they know who or when President Trump will choose as his VP is lying unless that person is named Donald J. Trump. Tom? Okay, Dasha Burns leading us off tonight here on Top Story. For more on what Trump's upcoming VP announcement means for the presidential race and the countdown to that first debate, I want to bring in our political pros tonight. Matt Gorman, he's a Republican strategist and former communications director for the National Republican Congressional Committee and a good friend of Top Story. And Naveen Nayak, he's the president of the Center for American Progress Action Fund and served in Hillary Clinton's 2016 presidential campaign. Gentlemen, we thank you both for being here. Matt, I'm going to start with you. Do we really expect the former president to announce his vice president pick possibly before the debate and with little less than a month to go before the RNC? I'd be shocked if he did. Look, the debate, it, it will reset everything, right? It'll be the stop moment that anything that comes before it will be reset in its wake. So then why would you take one of the few things you can control that will reset a narrative, be a Trump card, no pun intended, and put it right before there? If anything, let's say Trump has a bad debate, maybe it happens Friday. He has a rally in Virginia already scheduled. But you also have a possible sentencing uh, in early July. There are ways that you can use it to your advantage to reset a narrative if you need it. There's no reason to rush it. Yeah, I, 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 hear your, I hear your argument about maybe if he has a bad debate, he announces on Friday. But then you go into the weekend, you go into a holiday week, and you sort of lose all that big mo. Naveen, I do want to ask you, is, is there any, any sort of strategy here if he does possibly announce and there's coverage and they're covering the two men as they ent go to the debate? I know the, the, the running mate won't be able to enter the hall, but at least they'll be there and those pictures will be there. And there'll be a lot of hype and the story may be that more than the debate. Or is this just maybe a bad idea? I mean, I, I tend to agree with Matt that it, the more likely outcome here is on Friday to wash away a bad debate by Donald Trump. Uh, I think if they do it in advance, I think if there was a real opportunity for the campaign to really highlight how extreme Donald Trump and MAGA have become, because he's almost certainly going to pick someone who supports a national ban on abortion or who supports these extreme bans on abortion in states. And so I do think it allows the Biden campaign to refocus on how extreme sort of MAGA agenda has become. 
You know, Matt, I want to ask you, we mentioned this last time on Top Story, but I want to get your guys' take on this. CNN has said that they won't be fact-checking the candidates in real time. It'll happen afterwards. We know debates allow candidates to engage in sort of virtue signaling sometimes when, when moderators stop them and then they say, well, that's not right. And sometimes it's sort of, it, it's been hard to even hear people speak because people constantly get stopped. Do you think this is smart or do you think this is going to hurt the debate? I think it's smart. Look, moderators are there to facilitate the debate. They're not there to be participants in the debate. Um, and, and look, I think we remember, I think a lot of Republicans remember very clearly when Candy Crowley got be a little too over that line in 2012, and a lot of the Romney campaign, myself included, were really, really annoyed by that. I, I think it's important you facilitate the debate. Let the fact checkers afterwards fact check, or the other candidate can fact check too. That's what they're there for too. Yeah, it was an awkward moment there. I remember that with Romney and Candy Crowley. Naveen, do you think the moderators not fact checking in real time will hurt Joe Biden? Listen, I think there's a difference between fact checking, which is what Katie Crowley was sort of accused of doing there. Candy, yeah. And what do you, sorry, Candy Crowley, what do you, I just think we are dealing with a very different candidate. Donald Trump lies in every single well, sentence. Well, then, Naveen, that's the question then. What, are these, what do you think these moderators should do, right? Because, I mean, it, it's become. It, it's become where sometimes, and I'm not saying uh, Jake Tapper and Dana Batch are going to do this, but, it, but it's gotten to a point sometimes where it is virtue signaling, right? It's like you can't even get through an interview because everyone is being stopped. And I get it. Sometimes the, la the lies are rapid fire. But at some point, you also want to hear the full statement. I mean, what do you think the best sort of formula, formula is here? Well, listen, I, I, I can't speak for what Jake Tapper and Dana Batch should do. I do think it's... They're going to see Donald Trump make a lot of lies, and they might have to point out when he is, if he says that he won Michigan in 2020, right. that is a blatant lie, and we shouldn't pretend. I think if you're Biden campaign, it's different. You cannot spend your time fact-checking him. You have got to let uh, the American people know uh, the key moments when he is criticizing Joe Biden, and it is inaccurate, but that is not Joe Biden's job up there to fact-check, and he has got to move past that. Let Trump be Trump and focus on that's actually part of the goal here for the Biden campaign is they want the American people to be reminded of who Donald Trump is and how scary he's become. And they don't need to get into a squabble with him on the fact checking. Matt, did the, the Trump campaign make a mistake and set the bar too low for President Biden by attacking his age, his mental acuity? Now it sounds like right before the debate, they're sort of trying to reverse that, that, that strategy. But did they set the bar too low? I mean, look, I'll say this. We all have ears, we all have eyes. We all can see, you know, Joe Biden today versus the 2012 debates, for instance, against Paul Ryan. Lost a couple steps. I'll, I'll say that at the start. But the key with expectations is you got to play the long game with it because you're right. There will come a time when people are tuned into the debate like we are now, and you might be setting the bar way, way too low. And you're right. You've, over the last five days, you see, you've seen the Trump, Trump and his campaign try and raise him a little higher. I, I think Biden will be alert. I think both candidates will be alert and, you know, relatively on their game. And then it's up to them to do what they do. Uh, Naveen, if I can quote Eminem here, I mean, I think some voters are going to want the real Joe Biden to stand up, right? And by that, I mean, you know, you have times where he has a State of the Union and, and he gets great marks for that. But then you have other times where he'll deliver a speech to a different group and, and it, it's hard to follow him, right? Is there a worry within the Demo Democratic Party which Joe Biden will show up? I don't think so. In every one of these big moments, Joe Biden has shown up. And I, I, I understand that he and the people around him appreciate the weight of this moment. He is running for president in large part, not only to finish what he's been doing, but also the threat of Donald Trump being in the White House again is too grave. And, and I think he'll understand the magnitude. And I think in every big moment, whether it's the debates in 2020 or the State of the Union this year, he has shown up with the energy and passion that I think uh, the American people elected him for in 2020. Guys, I want to put up um, a statement up on the screen. It's not a statement. It was from an, an op-ed that Karl Rove wrote in the Wall Street Journal. He writes this, Joe Biden and Donald Trump will enter CNN's Atlanta studio next Thursday for the most important 90 90 minutes of this election season, what they say, the impressions they leave, their confrontations, mistakes, and humanizing moments could determine who wins in November. Matt, do you think this is the most important moment of this campaign? At least so far and for their foreseeable future, right? The next the next debate isn't until September, if they both do it, right? It's scheduled to happen. We'll see. And up until if somebody, one of them has a bad debate between then and now, they're going to have to talk about it and constantly play from behind. Uh, I think it's going to be very, very important. Naveen, what, what is your thoughts? Do you think it's all going to ride on this one debate and, and the president has to really show up for it? 
Listen, it's the as you highlighted, Tom, at the beginning, this is likely to be one of the largest audiences we're going to have between now and November. And I think this is a huge opportunity. I see a lot of upside uh, for President Biden, because I do think mostly people get a caricature of him on Fox News, on TikTok, and they're going to get a chance to see him unfiltered. And let's remember, Donald Trump is not in people's living rooms or in their social media feeds like he was in 2020. And I think this is an opportunity the Biden campaign understands for the American people to be reminded of who Donald Trump is. So, yes, I think it is one of the biggest moments. Matt, you know, Donald Trump is famous for not preparing for these debates, or at least saying he's not preparing. But I can remember even going back to 2016, the, the prep sessions weren't very long. Um, do you think he has to be careful with President Biden? Uh, yes. I mean, look, the contrast between him in 2016, where he was a little more cutting, but with a little bit of that New York charm he had been kind of throughout his life, 2020 was a little different. So there needs to be some sort of balance that's a little bit maybe towards 2016, less towards 2020. And he needs to be ready with no surprises. That's the key in debate prep. You want to practice even harder than you play. So when you get out there and the lights are on, you're ready for it. And then, Naveen, the question to you, last question for President Biden, right? What do you think he has to do to win this debate? I think there's a few things. I think the first is allowing the empathy and care that um, he has. I mean, he is one of the most empathetic leaders uh, we've seen, and I don't think the American people get to see that every day, and I think there's a real moment um, to showcase that. And then I think it is just to stand up there and remind the American people the progress he has made, what more he wants to do, and draw that contrast with a fairly unfit and unhinged candidate. And I think if those things come together, it'll be a, a really great night for the president. Naveen Nayak, Matt Gorman, always great to have you on Top Story. And a programming note, NBC News will have coverage of President Biden and former President Trump's presidential debate hosted by CNN on Thursday, but simulcast pretty much everywhere. I'll have special coverage and analysis beginning Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern on NBC News Now. And the debate starts at 9 p.m. on NBC. Okay, we want to move now to the Midwest and the disastrous flooding hitting multiple states, heavy storms inundating entire communities, leaving homes submerged and destroying crucial infrastructure. NBC's Adrian Broadus reports from where a dam could be on the brink of failure. Tonight, catastrophic flooding across the Midwest. In South Dakota, neighborhoods off the Big Sioux River are unrecognizable, with streets completely caved in and people unable to access their homes. Some cars washed away. Others are teetering on the edge of those collapsed roads. And the water is still gushing. In Minnesota, entire communities are submerged. We literally watched our childhood wash over the bank. Trees, buildings. Residents near Mankato are bracing for the possible failure of the Rapidam Dam. Oh my God. That's her life. Please. Jenny Barnes grew up here. Her father and brother live in this house by the river. We're hanging in there. Our house is hanging by a thread. It's not just their home they're worried about. The family has owned the dam store for more than 50 years. That's Lizzie, what we I worry mean, about the most. The store, we know the house is gone. We know we'll never be able to yeah, go back in that house. Anymore, but let's keep the damn store. That's yes, the main that's, goal. But that's our business. That's our it. livelihood. And in Sioux City, Iowa, the water levels are going down. Residents aren't out of the woods yet. Shaquille Brewster is there. 24 hours ago, this road was completely flooded. The water here is clearly receding, but you see the Big Sioux River is still at historic levels. Rich and Amy evacuated their mother overnight. How weird is it to be this close to the house but not able to access it? Right. It's devastating. Very, very, yeah, devastating is a good word. Devastating. It's right there. That's yeah. Crazy. It's within reach, but it's not within reach. With a strong line of thunderstorms already wreaking havoc across Michigan today, more rain is set to return here by the end of the week. Adrian Broadus joins us tonight from Blue Earth County in Minnesota. Adrian, you mentioned that dam is an imminent failure. How are residents preparing and what would the dam's failure mean for that community? Well, Tom, great questions. Some residents have already left the area and surrounded their homes, according to law enforcement, with sandbags. A city official tells me if this dam does collapse, you won't see a wall of water. So, for example, where I'm standing, it's unlikely, city officials say, that the water would spread to this area. However, the big concern tonight, 
city officials want to keep people away. For example, this park is closed, but people have been trying to get close to take pictures all day. Officials say if someone were to accidentally fall in, there's no way first responders could go in for a rescue. Tom? All right. Critical time there, Adrian. We appreciate that. We want to get to some breaking news right now. More severe weather slamming the Midwest. Let's get right over to NBC meteorologist Bill Cairns. Bill, we're just getting word of a possible tornado in Iowa. Yeah, we've had two or three. Now, we haven't had any fern damage or injuries or anything like that, but we know that we've seen them on the ground. Storm chasers have been reporting that. Severe thunderstorm watch Nebraska, southern half of Iowa, portion of Illinois until midnight tonight. And the storms we've been watching have been these storms near the Des Moines area. So Des Moines downtown is fine, but still a lot of lightning, hundreds of lightning strikes with this storm. The tornado was reported just to the north side here of Interstate 80, about 10 miles outside of the city. The thunder, severe thunderstorm has shifted to the south. No other tornadoes have been reported with that. Further to the east along Interstate 80, so now we're looking here at Cedar Rapids, and this is Eli. There was a stationary tornado. These storms have not been moving. They've been moving, just drifting ever so slowly. This is an hour radar loop, and you can see how the storm is in kind of the same spot. So we're also getting flash flooding, and that's what's happening in the Omaha area, especially around Council, Bluff, Council Bluffs. Here's Omaha downtown. Flash flood warning continues, and this storm is just lingering here. When that happens, that's when you can get some quick flash flooding, especially if you get rainfall rates of, you know, two three inches per hour. Tomorrow, we're going to track severe weather into the northeast, Tom, and we're talking New York City, Philadelphia, D.C. That humidity and that heat comes rushing back tomorrow. It's going to be oppressive just like it was a couple days ago, and then the thunderstorms are going to race through a lot of problems with severe weather in the northeast tomorrow. Okay, I'm sure we'll check back with you tomorrow. Uh, Bill, we thank you for all of that. We're going to continue our coverage right now as we continue. Uh, and I do, before we go, sorry, I messed up here. That's before. all right. Uh, the, uh, the heat, we know, we know there's a major heat impacting millions across the country. Yeah, that continues. And as far as the excessive heat goes, we're still in the middle of the country. We got some spots in like Salt Lake City was near 100 today. Denver hit 100 for the first time in two years today. And then we're still watching the really oppressive stuff to the south. Anyone that was you know, paying attention to the Copa America, the big soccer tournament going on uh, in Kansas City, the heat index is 103. Peru's playing Canada. And the assistant referee about a half hour ago, Tom, collapsed on the field. And they're saying likely due to heat illness. So uh, that's yeah, crazy. It is. Okay, we see all those triple-digit temperatures there as well. Okay, Bill, let's turn to the Americas now, where Puerto Rico triggered a heat advisory as temperatures are expected to surpass 100 degrees. The extreme weather slamming the island as it continues to struggle with mass power outages. The company behind the island's power grid announcing this week that it's postponing $65 million worth of much-needed maintenance. Here's Guad Venegas. Tonight, a power crisis in Puerto Rico remains unsolved. More than six years after Hurricane Maria wrecked havoc on the decaying infrastructure, locals say blackouts are still a constant problem. Things have continued to get very, very bad. Um, hospitals have had power outages, extended power outages. And most people absolutely cannot afford even generators and much less rooftop solar. Luma Energy, the island's privately owned power company, announcing this week they are suspending $65 million worth of maintenance projects due to what they say are budget constraints. Some of those projects meant to upkeep more than 100,000 light posts, repair underground circuits, and mitigate fires. <laughs> The move increasing long-standing tensions between locals and the energy company. And coming just weeks after a massive blackout left over 340,000 people without power amid record-breaking heat. Luma Energy telling the Associated Press the company blames the suspension on a delay in funds disbursement from the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Luma is incentivized to do the work that involves reimbursement from FEMA, but has no incentive to use the, its own budget to do regular maintenance and repair, opting not to do the, the regular maintenance and repair that the grid needs. Luma Energy did not respond to NBC's request for comment. Top Story traveled to Puerto Rico in 2022 and spoke to the then CEO of Luma Energy, who said Hurricane Maria ravaged an already delicate power grid. You know, it took decades for it to end up in the state it's in, and it's going to take us uh, a few years to get it back to, to a system that is what we might expect in, in other parts of the world. Tonight, an island waiting for reliable power and hope to be fully restored. Guad Venegas joins us tonight from Atlanta. So, Guad, we're just at the start of hurricane season. And as you mentioned, there was already a nine-day blackout on the island. As these investigations and suits get underway, do officials have the resources to handle yet another major blackout? 
Well, Tom, the governor, Pedro Pierluisi, has activated the National Guard to help with that energy crisis, but they can only do so much and help those in the most need. There are pragmatic solutions like using generators and also solar panels in homes. But according to the expert we spoke to, solar panels can cost $25 to $30,000. And if somebody wants a generator, that'll cost $1,500 to $5,000. And many in Puerto Rico can't afford that. The only real solution here is to invest in that infrastructure, which we've known for years, but as we've seen, Tom, has been quite challenging. Guad Venegas for Squad, we appreciate that. And we continue to follow the developing news out of Kenya, where residents are protesting a new tax bill. The demonstrations reaching new heights today with protesters storming and burning the country's parliament building. Tonight, Kenya's president defending the police force's decision to open fire on those involved. NBC's Danielle Hamamjin has the latest and a warning. Some of the images you're about to see are disturbing. The sound of gunfire echoing through the streets of Nairobi. Police opening fire on demonstrators trying to storm parliament. While inside, lawmakers approved a deeply unpopular bill expected to raise taxes by $2.7 billion. Kenyans, outraged, say the plan will raise the cost of living, which is already unaffordable. This man making it all the way into the National Assembly chamber. We don't fear you guys. You hypocrites. Outside, clouds of tear gas filled the streets for a seventh day. In a shocking moment, Alma Obama, President Obama's half-sister, tear gassed during a live interview on CNN. They're being tear gassed. The bodies of protesters seen lying on the ground. At least five people shot dead, dozens wounded, according to a medical official on the ground. Kenyan President William Ruto addressing the nation tonight, defending the police. Today, Kenya experienced an unprecedented attack on its democracy, rule of law, and the integrity of its constitutional institutions calling the deadly protests treasonous the republic of kenya was infiltrated and hijacked by a group of organized criminals the president is under pressure by the international monetary fund to cut deficits but what's at stake protesters say the basic ability to feed their families. Fathers can put food, food on their table. We need change in this country, and this finance bill is not going to bring that change. The Kenyan military has now been deployed to support police. Meanwhile, the controversial bill will move on to the third reading, after which it will land on the desk of the president for his signature. Tonight, the U.S. and the U.N. condemning the violence and urging restraint. Tom. We thank Danielle for that report. Now to the war in Gaza, where the IDF continues its relentless fight against Hamas. The Israeli Supreme Court issuing a critical decision today to begin drafting ultra-Orthodox Jewish seminary students into the military. This marks a controversial divergence from decades of precedent which exempted students enrolled in full-time religious study from serving. For more on this landmark ruling, I want to get right over to Josh Letterman in London. Josh, walk our viewers through this. This war has already been ongoing for nearly nine months. Some viewers at home might be asking, why make this decision now? Well, this ongoing war certainly has raised the stakes for this decision in a very visible and powerful way, Tom. But this is actually a collision course Israel has been on for many decades as the ultra-Orthodox has been growing faster than any other portion of the population. And actually, back in 2017, the law on the books that allowed these military exemptions expired. And there have been various delays since then that kept it in place. But essentially, the Supreme Court has said, time is up. There is no current law that allows these individuals to be exempted, and so it's time for them to serve. Is this decision more about fairness than a need for more soldiers? Well, it's both. Israel does need soldiers as this war drags on, and it is heavily reliant on reservists who are in their late 20s, their 30s, even their 40s, have to leave their families and their jobs to serve in this ongoing war. Uh, but not only that, the growing portion of the population that is secular feels that this is an unfair burden to be putting on only one portion of the population uh, to have the ultra-Orthodox who benefit from the security and the defense of the military not contributing it. 
we should point out the ultra orthodox make the argument that they do contribute to Israel's security through their prayer, through their study of Torah. They say that is just as critical way to defend their country. You know, Josh, we've been covering this war since it started. We've also been covering the politics of Israel, and Prime Minister Netanyahu has had a very tough time. We know that his coalition includes two ultra orthodox parties who are now openly against this decision. They always have been. How critical of a setback is this for the prime minister? Well, it could be huge because those two ultra-Orthodox parties have said if these exemptions don't stay in place, they might pull out of Netanyahu's government, and that could potentially crumble his very fragile governing coalition. But we should point out, Netanyahu has faced many of these potential setbacks before where it looked like he might not be able to hold on to power. Somehow, until now, he's always found a way to make it work. And so Netanyahu says he's going to find some legislation that will appease everyone. We'll have to see whether or not he's able to do that. All right, Josh, thank you. Still ahead tonight, Missing in Paradise, a woman from Chicago disappearing while on vacation in the Bahamas, police putting out that flyer where she was last seen. Plus, two astronauts currently stuck in space after their return trip was delayed three times, the problems keeping them in orbit. And have you heard of or seen driverless taxis, and would you trust one? Our Valerie Castro traveling to Phoenix to try them out and ask the city's mayor why this new type of transportation is now booming there. Stay with us. Welcome back. You've heard us talk about autonomous vehicles here on Top Story, but what about robo-taxis? The service is growing in select cities across the country. Just today, one company called Waymo opening up its service to all San Francisco users. And a Wall Street Journal article that caught our eye showed their popularity is exploding in one major city, Phoenix, Arizona. NBC's Valerie Castro went there to check them out firsthand and to see what's working and what's not. Here in Phoenix, robo taxis are a hot ride. Open up the app, choose a destination. And just a few moments later. All right, the car is here. I'm gonna use the app to unlock it. And away we go. Hello, Valerie. So we just hopped in the Waymo. There is no driver behind the wheel, and we're going to go pick up the mayor of Phoenix. The robo-taxi, owned by Google parent company Alphabet, takes us for a smooth while cautious ride, the steering wheel turning as if an invisible hand is guiding it. And when we get to a stop sign... Complete stop. We reach our destination with no issues. We've arrived. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Excellent. Phoenix Mayor Kate Gallego is a big fan. Waymo drivers don't have the kind of bad days that, that human drivers do. Do you think this is safer than an actual human being behind the wheel? The technology can see so many more things and process it so much more quickly. I think in the long term it will be safer. Why is this working so well here in Phoenix? I think we've been very open to the technology and, and there have been some political challenges in other communities that we have not had. We have an open grid system of streets, and so I think that is probably a little bit easier to navigate. But incidents like this low-speed crash into a telephone pole in May, leading to a software recall of its Phoenix fleet, more than 600 cars. The robo-taxis caught on camera making other mistakes, turning into oncoming traffic in Tempe, swerving in and out of its lane, driving into a construction zone, and ignoring an officer's instructions to pull to the side of the road. Sir, there's no one there. Waymo declining to comment on specific incidents, but adding that they continue to refine the technology. Waymo is the subject of an investigation by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration for various collisions, saying several incidents involved collisions with clearly visible objects that a competent driver would be expected to avoid. Waymo saying in part, NHTSA plays a very important role in road safety, and we will continue to work with them as part of our mission to become the world's most trusted driver. In other cities, driverless taxis are also making headlines. Waymo, going the wrong way! A cruise vehicle owned by General Motors and a competitor of Waymo's running over and dragging a woman who had just been struck by a hit-and-run driver last year in San Francisco. In a statement, Cruz said its car braked aggressively to minimize the impact with the woman after the other car launched the pedestrian directly in front of the cruise vehicle. Regulators temporarily suspending the company's permits. Waymo criticized 
criticized for causing traffic jams and stopping in the middle of the street. Hi, how are you? Crossing guards telling NBC Bay Area they've nearly been hit in the crosswalk. It did not recognize me in the intersection. But back in Phoenix, Waymo says it's growing, dominating 315 square miles around the city, the largest metro area it serves in the country. And it's the only robo-taxi that picks up and drops off at a major airport. Andrew Maynard is a professor at Arizona State University School for the Future of Innovation in Society. Waymo, as other companies that are developing similar technologies, are, are still learning. So it's not 100% safe. If we have a technology that occasionally runs into poles, maybe that's the price to pay for developing a technology which will ultimately, hopefully, be safer than humans. Removing the human element is why a community group called Phoenix Babes Who Walk partnered with the company, calling it a safer option for women and members of marginalized groups traveling alone who might encounter a bad experience with a rideshare driver. We've had folks who are um, gay or lesbian and they're afraid to get into their car and hold their spouse's hand um, because of what might happen with their driver, comments that may come up um, unsolicited. While the tech continues to improve, some believe it could become the norm down the road. To me, the most exciting scenario is that we use self-driving cars as a stepping stone to a future where we have completely rethought transportation. Okay, Valerie Castro joins us now live. Valerie, fascinating report. I, I want to start with something we saw there. The, the police officer he was trying to move the Waymo car out of the way. How does that work? So just like any human driver behind the wheel gets better with experience, so does this technology. And Waymo says they actually train with law enforcement and other first responders for emergency situations. And they actually sent us some video that shows the car interpreting a situation using AI technology. And here, the traffic lights are out at this intersection. And so the Waymo sees a police officer in the middle of the road and sees the officer eventually waving it through the intersection. So it is interpreting the officer flagging it through. And it also can see sirens, say there's an ambulance behind the car. It will also pull over when it sees that. Talk to me about the regulations here. How was Phoenix able to sort of figure this out? Phoenix has been a big champion of autonomous vehicle technology, and the former governor, Doug Ducey, actually signed several executive orders that reduced a lot of the regulations and allowed for these vehicles to be tested on public roads. And of course, now it's expanded to the public actually using these vehicles. You know, I can remember when Uber started expanding, right? And a lot of cities fought Uber, and now Uber's all over the world. Is that what's happening with Waymo? Are they expanding to other cities? They are. And just today, as we mentioned, San Francisco is now uh, an open market. All users in San Francisco can use it. Previously, they had a waiting list. Waymo also operates in limited capacity in Los Angeles, in Austin, Texas. So they're continuing to grow. Okay, I, I definitely want to try it, but I got to tell you, I was watching your video. It made me a little nervous. <laughs> you did it, I think, four times, you told me. Yes. Talk to me. I mean, were you comfortable with it by the end? What was the first experience Look, like? the first one is definitely unnerving. I mean, you look in the front seat and there's no one behind the wheel. It's turning by itself. It's taking left-hand turns. But after a while, you're pretty comfortable with it because, look, it's not going to go past the speed limit. The driver's not going to have road rage. Um, you're not going to have to worry about a drunk driver behind the wheel anything like that. So the car actually goes kind of slow and it's kind of boring after a while, to be honest. Did it get to a point where you sort of lost yourself, you were able to zone out or check your phone and not be constantly focused on the road? Yeah, it's kind of nice. And, you know, we watched, it stopped at the stop sign. It it was cautious. Again, the ride was kind of boring after a while because it follows all the traffic laws. Again, Valerie, uh, an amazing report, really insightful. We appreciate you and your team, what you guys did there. Just ahead, the dramatic house fire rescue. We got to show you this video, an officer rushing in to pull an elderly couple from the flames. The moment he collapsed, after that incredible save and how he's doing tonight. Stay with us. Back now with Top Stories News Feed. We begin with the urgent search for a Chicago woman missing in the Bahamas. Police there say 41-year-old Taylor Casey was last seen on Wednesday on Paradise Island, about 20 miles from the capital of Nassau. Police releasing that flyer you just saw there. Casey was attending a yoga retreat in the area. An investigation is now underway. Her family is en route to the island to join that search effort. Okay, a quick thinking deputy in New Jersey saving an elderly couple from a house fire. Here it is, the body cam shows the dramatic scene as an officer races towards a burning home engulfed in smoke, discovering a trapped couple inside. The officer first rescues the wife, an elderly woman, from the flames. He then returns to save her disabled husband, 
pulling him to safety. And then watch this, the officer collapses. The couple and the deputy were taken to the hospital and are now recovering. Everyone seems to be doing okay. All right, and the flight delay story you might never be able to top. That's because it's in outer space where two astronauts are now stuck. They've stayed in orbit longer than expected. Their return flight postponed three times. You may remember Butch Wilmore and Sunita Williams. They launched on the Boeing Starliner earlier this month. They plan to spend a week on the International Space Station, then return to Earth on June 18th. Well, plans change because of a series of slow helium leaks and thruster malfunctions on their spacecraft. NASA saying it needs to complete tests on the capsule before setting a return date. The ISS has enough supplies to support the extended visit. Next tonight to the alarming surge in COVID cases nationwide. According to the CDC, you can see right here on the map, COVID infections are growing or likely growing across the U.S. in 39 states as several new variants contribute to the summer spike. I want to bring in infectious disease physician, Dr. Amish Adalja. Doctor, thanks for being here on set. So one of the reasons why I want to do this, right, there's so much we know about COVID, but it seems to always kind of creep back in our lives. People are planning summer vacations, summer parties, and some of those plans are getting ruined because people are getting sick with COVID. Do we know why it's spreading again and why it's spreading so fast? You have to remember that this is an endemic respiratory virus. It's never going away. And what we're going to see with this virus is continual evolution to try and infect a population that has a lot of immunity from vaccines, from prior infections. This is the new normal, and we expected this summer increase to occur, just like it occurred in the prior summer. Any difference from last summer to this summer? Anything you're noticing? Just that this, uh, these variants get more and more tricky. They are able to get around a lot of our immunity. But the other thing that's different is we've got so much more knowledge, so much more tools, yeah. so much more immunity in the population. So even though you see 39 states increasing, we don't hear about hospitals yeah. and crisis. We don't hear about people worrying about if there's enough ventilators. We don't hear about deaths going up uh, alarming, at alarming rates. Yeah, and there's no reason to freak anybody out about this. I, I do want to ask you, though, do we know anything about the testing? Because you talk about these new variants, right? And so many people are relying on those take-home tests, and I just wonder if they're still effective. Obviously, not, not as effective as if you go into a lab or you go to see a doctor or something like that, but I am hearing anecdotally that people are, are using their at-home tests and they're not working like they used to. Are you hearing this? Is there any research on this? These tests should pick up these variants. There should be no reason that the variant is evading the diagnostic test. However, people have to think about what that test, when you're doing that test, and when it's going to be positive, when it's going to be negative. Remember, a home test is only going to be positive when there's enough virus there to trigger that to turn positive. So that might mean people are testing too early, and then you tell them to repeat the test or get a PCR test if they're still sick. And then let me ask you, they have expiration dates, these tests, so people actually have to check that. Is that something like, hey, you have a test a test kit and it expires, it expired a week ago. Should you get rid of it or do they hold up? They do hold up, and the FDA has uh, a website where they list all the extensions of the expiry date. So in general, if you're using an expired test and if it's positive, you can think that's a true positive. If it's negative and it's an expired test, you might want to get a better test. Any precautions people should take this summer if they're elderly or if they're immunocompromised? So if you're elderly or in any high-risk condition, you have to remember that COVID-19 still represents a threat to you, and that means making sure that you think about wearing masks in crowded, congregated indoor settings. You get drugs like Paxlovid if you test positive, and there's also even a new monoclonal antibody called PEMGARDA for the most immunocompromised uh, that they can get to kind of top off their antibodies from the vaccine. You know, you're, you're one of these experts I like to have on because you're not afraid to go against the grain sometimes, right? Is the, is the COVID vaccine still worth it? It's worth it depending upon what your risk factors are for severe disease. So if you're somebody that has no major problems, this vaccine is not going to give you much durable protection, the current vaccine. There's going to be a new one in the fall. But if you're high risk, you need to stay up to date because those are the people that we see getting hospitalized and dying from COVID-19 even now. And then give me the reason. Why does it spread more in the summer? I think that it has to do with the evolutionary pace of this virus. And it, and it may be that the virus tends to... to generate new mut mut mutations around this time, and that's what happened in the summer before. And it also could be people, people um, out of school, that they're, they're interacting in certain different ways that they weren't before. Yeah, getting closer. But, it, but this has happened almost every summer since the COVID-19. Graduation virus. ceremonies, picnics, whatever it is. Doctor, always great to have you here. We thank you for being here. Coming up, the terror through the border. The Department of Homeland Security identifying hundreds of migrants with potential ties to ISIS. NBC News just learning dozens have been released into the U.S. Just how many remain at large? That's next.
We are back now with the latest from the southern border. Officials are on high alert after the Department of Homeland Security identified 400 migrants with potential ties to the terrorist group ISIS, saying they crossed the border and were released into the U.S. ICE detaining more than 150 of those suspects, but many still remain at large. NBC's Julia Ainsley reports. Tonight, NBC News has learned more than 50 migrants with potential ties to an ISIS-affiliated smuggling network are at large in America. Many illegally crossed the border and were released into the U.S. by Border Patrol because there was no information suggesting terror ties at the time. Now, their whereabouts are unknown as immigration agents look to arrest them, U.S. officials tell us, saying they're among a group of over 400 migrants DHS identified in the U.S. from Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Moldova, Kyrgyzstan, Georgia, and Russia as subjects of concern because they were brought to the U.S. by an ISIS-affiliated smuggling network, something the FBI director warned about earlier this year. Some of the overseas facilitators of the smuggling network have ISIS ties uh, that we're very concerned about. ICE has located and arrested over 150 of the 400 migrants so far, with some already deported from the U.S., officials say, adding authorities are not panicking because their ties to ISIS are not certain, but they're prioritizing their arrest out of an abundance of caution. The problem is the volume of people coming across the southern border, individuals from ISIS and other affiliated groups have recognized it as a weak point in our defense and they're using this opportunity to try to sneak in. NBC News was first to report on a similar arrest of an Uzbek man in Baltimore, whose country alerted the U.S. he was affiliated with ISIS. That man, like the others apprehended so far, was arrested on immigration charges, not terrorism-related charges. ISIS-K has claimed responsibility for deadly terror attacks in Russia and Iran in the past year. And recently, the DHS Inspector General sharply criticizing vetting at the U.S. southern border, saying DHS is at risk of admitting dangerous persons into the country or enabling asylum seekers who may pose significant threats to public safety and national security to continue to reside in the United States. Tom, two senior law enforcement officials told NBC News they are not tracking a terror plot from this group of migrants, but their arrest on immigration charges come out of an abundance of caution. Tom? We thank Julia for that. Now to Top Stories Global Watch and a check of what else is happening around the world. We start with new video from inside that deadly battery factory fire in South Korea that we first told you about last night. New surveillance footage showing the moment the blaze started. You see it right there in the right hand of your screen. It started when a small explosion erupted from a pile of batteries at a lithium battery plant southwest of Seoul. Employees trying to extinguish the small fire, but smoke quickly fills the room. Look at that as flames spread. Today, the owner of the company apologized to the families of the 23 workers killed, but said the building complied with all safety precautions. Okay, German riot police clashing with Serbian soccer fans ahead of a Euro match. Look at this video showing Serbian fans chanting and getting and setting off red smoke grenades in Munich ahead of the game between Serbia and Denmark. Riot police then spraying a crowd of Serbian soccer fans with tear gas. France throw, fans then throwing lit flares in response and fighting with officers. No word yet on any arrests or injuries. And the International Criminal Court issuing arrest warrants for two prominent Russian officials for their alleged crimes committed during the war with Ukraine. The warrants are for a former Russian defense minister and a Russian general who were accused of targeting civilians and civilian infrastructure. ICC judges say they are responsible for Russian missile strikes against Ukraine's electric infrastructure. We thank you so much for watching Top Story tonight. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. Stay right there. More news on the way. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.